Okay. Hello. Uh, thank you for joining us for our webinar today on Indigenous Law for Land, Air, and Water. Uh, I hope everyone is staying well. My name is Alexis Stoymanoff, and I'm the Director of Communications here at West Coast Environmental Law. Uh, I'm streaming to you today from my home in Vancouver on Coast Salish territory, the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil people. And I'm very grateful for the privilege I have to live and work on these lands. So we'd also love to know where everyone is zooming in from today too. So uh, if you want, you can uh, participate in the chat and send us a message just to, uh, to tell us where you are. Uh, if you want to use the chat, if you're not familiar with the webinar software, uh, just look for the little chat button uh, at the bottom of your window. If you kind of hover around there, you should be able to open it up. Um, so today my colleagues will be providing us a little bit of an intro to Indigenous law and some of the ways that we interact with it here at West Coast through our RELAW program. Uh, and that stands for Revitalizing Indigenous Law for Land, Air and Water. So you're going to be hearing from three of my talented colleagues from our Indigenous law team, uh, Maxine Mattelpee, Shelby Lindley and Rihanna Seymour-Hurry. And obviously this is a really big topic, so we're not gonna be able to cover everything today, uh, but my colleagues will be covering some of the basics about indigenous law and sharing some examples. Um, and unfortunately we won't be able to get to all of the questions that were submitted in advance of the webinar, but we will try to share some helpful resources later on for people who wanna dig a little deeper and learn more about indigenous law after today's webinar. Uh, so today, um, just a couple technical notes before we start. Participants are automatically muted for the webinar, uh, but you are welcome to join in the discussion using the chat. Uh, one thing to note, if you want your chat messages to be visible by all other participants, you just have to click the little drop down that says um, all panelists and attendees, uh, and then your messages will be visible to the rest of the group. And lastly, I'd just like to remind everyone to please keep your chat messages uh, respectful and on topic. And uh, I think that's it for the housekeeping for now. Uh, and I'll just hand it over to our first panelist, Maxine. Hi, everyone. This is Maxine Madelpi. I am here in Comox Pentlatch Territory. It's so um, great to be here today and to notice in the chat that, uh, that you're from all over the world. I've seen posts from California and Montreal and Squamish, Silcoteen, and Anyways, it's uh, great that you're able to join us today. So I am Quagilt and Mamtagila, and the photo that you're seeing is Quagilt territory. So that's near the village where I'm from, which is Sahis, also known as uh, Fort Rupert, which is just outside of Port Hardy. So I am the project program lead for RELAW, Revitalizing Indigenous Law for Land, Air and Water and at West Coast Environmental Law. And I'm going to now pass the feather to our next panelist. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Shelby Lindley. Uh, my parents are Wanda and David Lindley, and my closest ancestors are Sylvia Reese and Lottie and Isaac Lindley. So I am Seal Okanagan, Nilketmik Thompson, and Shikwetmik Shushwap on my dad's side. And I'm of mixed European ancestry on my mom's side. And I grew up in a place called Kulshana, so that's just outside of Mare, BC. Um, and yeah, I just want to take a moment before we begin just to honor the land of my people and also the land of the Tekemlipsh to Shikwetmik people. Um, that's where I currently live and work. Um, so I started my position with West Coast Environmental Law in November of 2018 as a staff lawyer with the RELAW project. And shortly after that, I welcomed my first daughter. So her name is Sophia and we call her the little RELAW baby. So, um, so these pictures that I'm sharing with you today, um, the top left is a picture of my dad and his brother at a roundup that we have each year. So that's part of our seasonal interactions with the land. And the bottom left picture is of the, um, it's a viewpoint near where we live. So you can see quite a good view of the territory from there. And then on the right hand side is Nicola Lake. And so that's where I spent a lot of my time on the beach when I was growing up. So those are some of my favorite places. And yeah, now I'll just pass it over to Rihanna. Bonjour, my name is Kian Jean Jean Kanto Kandijna Kaz Makwan Dutam Neongashi and Dunji. My English name is Rihanna Seymour Huri. 
I come from the Anishinaabeg Nation and Treaty 3 territory, um, which is in Northwestern Ontario and a part of Manitoba. Uh, my community is called Anishinaabeg of Neongashing, which means Big Island. I come from the Bear Clan. Um, so yeah, I was telling um, the other panelists that when I was looking through pictures on, about my territory, um, all I found was sunset pictures. So it's so hard to find this blue picture. And also my pictures all had to do with water too. So um, that's an ice road on the left and then you could just see the water in the spring and in the fall. Um, so yeah, those are different areas of my territory. And I'm almost a lawyer, so um, in a few weeks I'll be. And yeah, I work full time with West Coast in the Relaw program. So now I'll pass it back to Maxine. So I'll just quickly go over the agenda. The first thing that we're going to talk about is what is Indigenous law. So there are some important distinctions between Indigenous law and Aboriginal law. So today we're not going to be talking about Canadian law. We're going to try to focus on Indigenous law and Brianna is going to take us through that section. I'll then talk about West Coast environmental law and the RELAW program. Um, we're going to talk about story as law. Actually, Shelby's going to lead that section. And then uh, we're going to actually listen to a story, Father, Son, and Mother Earth. We'll have some reflections from the three of us. And then we have some questions that we'll be posing to you um, and then closing remarks. So we'll ho hopefully we get through all of this in the next hour. Okay. Okay, so yeah. Um, Indigenous law is a massive, massive topic. Um, so I think today we're only providing a doorway into um, exploration of Indigenous law if you haven't interacted with it. But from what I see with the comments, I'm sure there's a lot of people who have interacted with their laws or with other Indigenous laws. But basically, um, Indigenous laws are expressions of worldview. Um, they are very much land-based and specific to the Indigenous nations and their landscapes. So some examples of Indigenous law are Anishinaabe law. So I'm Anishinaabe. Um, there's Silk law, Sequetmik laws, um, Haida laws, you know, Chilcotin laws. So um, the laws are specific to the Indigenous nations and their territories. Um, just making it clear that there's no pan-Indigenous um, we're all distinct nations. However, there is a lot of similarities with, you know, our laws coming from the land itself. Um, and the sources of Indigenous laws come from many different sources. Uh, some sources are through customs, through songs, through stories, through language, and through ceremonies. Uh, the RELAW program really focuses on the sources of stories and we'll get a little bit more into that. But as um, Max has said, you know, Indigenous law is not Aboriginal law. So Aboriginal law is Canadian law. It's section 35, um, you know, the rights and title of Aboriginal peoples. So Indigenous law, again, is the law of the peoples themselves specific to the Indigenous nations and their landscape. So, there are many Indigenous nations on Turtle Island and in Canada, so then there's a lot of Indigenous laws that apply um, across those territories. Next slide. So to kind of give a few examples of um, Indigenous law in comparison to Canadian law to, I know it kind of supports with understanding a bit more with a lot of people. So, um, the left side is artwork done by Danielle Morrison. She's Anishinaabe. And this was through her lens on what Anishinaabe Nibe and meant to her. So Anishinaabe Nibe and is Anishinaabe water laws. And there was a lot of work done within my nation to kind of make this Nibe declaration, which is an expression of water laws. Um, and this was her perspective on what, you know, our water laws are. So you can see that there's a lot of interconnection. Um, you know, there's 
intergen Danielle talks about how there's intergenerational knowledge knowledge exchange with those two women there. So that's supposed to be a granddaughter and a daughter or our granddaughter and a grandmother. Um, there's fish, there's birds, there's plants, both on the land and in the water. Um, you know, you see air and the sun and spirits and the stars. So everything is interconnected and reliant on water. Um, so that was that perspective. And yeah, it's just an interconnected web, right? But then in comparison with um, Canada law in relating to water, um, we see many different legislations and acts and the Canada Water Act is about the uh, management and regulation of water for mainly human use. But on the left side, you see Anishinaabe law expressing the right to water for all beings. Um, so, you know, there's, there's distinctions, but, um, you know, both are valid and I'm not saying one is wrong or one is right, but just to kind of get an idea. So, yeah, that's kind of some examples of that um, coming from my nation. Um, and we see these, these laws kind of interacting in, you know, media and in our circles and everything like that. But, um, and if you turn to the next slide, Alexis. We can see that um, Indigenous nations are still you know, relying on their Indigenous laws to protect their lands and specifically their waters. Um, so we do see in mass media that, you know, Indigenous laws are still being upheld and followed today. Um, and we do see the conflict between, you know, Indigenous law and Canadian law. So now I'll just pass it to back to Max to explain a little bit about the RELAW program and how we work with Indigenous laws. Okay, hey, thanks, Rihanna. So, um, what the I just want to before I go on acknowledge um, the beautiful artwork that's in this slide. So that was designed by Carissa Dickey, who was is part of the Fort Nelson First Nation, and the Fort Nelson First Nation were part of our first cohort. And um, so the slide is, is, I think, really beautiful in that it depicts an important part of the work, which is storytelling. So in our work, we use the methodology that was developed by people like Hadley Friedland, um, Val Napoleon, and John Burroughs at the University of Victoria. And um, the methodology relies on story work. So there are lots of sources of Indigenous law, but story work is an important part of of the work that that we do so importantly how we do the work is as important as what we do so we learn from stories and elders in doing this indigenous law work and if you can see in that photo how happy everyone looks and we have often found that when we do the work that people are really excited about the work they find it to be healing work and um it, it generally makes people feel really, really good. So the work we work in partnership in, in collaboration with an emphasis on reciprocity, we feel like um, we uh, give and receive um, in partnership with our with our partners. So yeah, it's very much a collaborative relationship is what we what we try to develop in doing the work. We do the work in um, a trauma-informed way. We recognize that uh, sometimes it's, it can be hard to do this work because it brings up, um, you know, feelings of, uh, you know, really looking at our own identities and, and some of the traumas that, that uh, First Nations have been through. So we, we try to be very trauma-informed in doing our work together. Um, so an example of the kind of work that we do could be um, with the Heltzik First Nation. So the Heltzik First Nation, uh, and I'll just read here, the, the implementation of the Oceans Act. So they're working on an Oceans Act and um, it coming with the, the authority to enforce our own laws and the authority to just live as Heltzik people in respect with Quilas 
and also for non hiltzik people to live in respect with their Quilas as well. So that's a quote from Desiree Lawson, who was the um, researcher and facilitator with the Heltzik First Nation. They were part of our first cohort in 2017, and we continue to work with them. We've learned that the, that the work can't really get done in one year. Uh, one year is really just enough to get started. But um, so that Heltzik work is a really good example of how um, you know, some of the product of the work is around making important decisions for in uh, protecting the environment. But the methodology can also be used not just around environmental decision making, it, it has been used in the criminal law context, um, contracts, property law, family law, importantly, and um, child and family protection matters. So the methodology, we focus, of course, on environmental work because we're an environmental nonprofit, but the methodology can be used in lots of different ways. Um, the next slide shows um, a, a map of where our partners are. You, um, so if you look at cohort one, which is the white um, stars, you'll see just four four little stars. And then we, we've kind of spread out over the province. And we're now working up into Yukon territory with the Taku River Klingit First Nation. And um, yeah, kind of, kind of moving all over the, the province. And I think that's it. We're on to our passing the feather to Rihanna. Okay, so to get a little bit more into the methodology that we use, so like Max said, we use the Indigenous Law Research Unit methodology developed by Val Napoleon and Hadley Friedland. And um, I like to think of the RELAW program or this methodology that we use in three phases. So the first phase is usually lasts about a year, a year and a half, which is like that getting started um, part of it. And this is the really relationship building part. This is where the re we call ourselves re lawyers. So this is where the re lawyers and the community guides who we're working with um, start researching stories, finding as much stories as we can, either audio or published, um, which can be between you know like hundreds and hundreds of stories. And then from there, we decide which ones, uh, which stories we want to. Uh, focus on that have to do with our issue. So, um, you know, if it's on fisheries governance and watershed management, then we're going to really focus on stories that have to do with fisheries or water, right? Um, so that, so that's kind of us doing our homework. So, so then once we actually go into community and start engaging with elders and knowledge holders, we have this brief understanding um, of the stories, and then we start discussing those stories and um, having dialogue and discussion with those elders, again, in a trauma-informed approach and community members. And we discuss um, what those stories mean and what the teachings behind those stories are. After multiple uh, community focus groups, we call them, um, we, we tr transcribe all of those audio files and then we start weaving um, the knowledge of the stories and the elders together, utilizing um, you know, quotes and um, uh, different mediums with, you know, pictures and things like that. And the report is usually about 100 to 200 pages. Um, so it's quite long. Um, but we know that, you know, uh, many community members aren't going to be reading a 100 to 200 page report. So then um, hand in hand with the long report, we write a summary report. So the summary report, you've seen those pictures of the summary report in the PowerPoint that we showed you, but it's just a summary of what we learned. So, um, you know, a lot of pictures and quotes and the main teachings and principles that come from the story. So that's kind of like also a doorway into the actual big report. Um, so, so yeah, we create those and then those go out to the community, of course. Um, utilizing, I mean, using, you know, knowledge quotes and stuff, we go back to the knowledge holders and they're like, did we get this right, you know, um, so the dialogue and discussion with knowledge holders continues, and they can withdraw, you know, their consent if they wish to, um, if they don't want to share their quotes anymore um, before publishing, if the nation decides to publish it. Um, a lot of, sometimes they don't choose to publish it, so the Statlium, 
um, legal report is actually available on our website. So after the first phase, so like it's like learning and relationship building, then we get into, um, okay, we have all of this, you know, we have all of this information. Um, what, what do the people want to do with it? What do the decision makers want to do with it? Do they want to write a plan? Do they want to write a law? Do they want to write a declaration? Um, do they want to stay away from written products? You know, it's kind of up to the, the partner. We don't call them clients. So it's up to the partner of how they want to um, utilize that, that work before and um, if they want to make an Indigenous law instrument. And an example of the Indigenous law instrument is what Max was talking about with the Hiltzuk Oceans Law and Relatives Act. So, and then the third phase, so this is usually probably in the third, fourth, maybe fifth year of the RELA program um, partnership, we start looking at and exploring le Canadian legal recognition. So through the second phase, there's a lot of strategizing with decision makers. So it's like, um, we start asking and discussing on like, what are the tools available that we can use and um, uh, to kind of start enforcing, you know, those laws that are in that uh, legal instrument. And nations choose to go in a variety of ways. So they can either um, do financial pressure, litigation, or on the ground enforcement. Um, so yeah, there's a diff many different ways and strategies that nations will, you know, will choose to go, um, go forward in. And, you know, throughout that too, there's like a lot of community dialogue and um, yeah, just a lot of facilitated discussion with decision makers. So it's, um, it's really interesting, but yeah, that, that's kind of like the overview of the RELAW program. So now I'll pass it on to Shelby. Thank you, Rihanna. Um, yeah, so Maxine and Rihanna kind of spoke about some of the ways that RELA approaches law, and I'm just going to expand a bit more on the idea of story as law. And so this concept is something that speaks to me really personally. Um, you'll see on the slide a picture of my grandmother there. So her name was Lottie Lindley, um, and she passed away in 2016. Um, so that's a picture of her laying in front of her living room window where I grew up, and that, that was one of her favorite places. Um, but you'll see on the right hand side as well, um, a, a picture of a book and so she was involved in the development of a collection of stories and histories of our land that was written by um, John Lyon and so um, yeah it was called Okanagan Grouse Woman and it was published shortly after she passed away um, and so it was actually a really um, incredible gift for our family to be able to read her stories in that way shortly after she left us um, but yeah so in the book, she speaks about the teachings from her elders um, and her understanding of the stories of our lands and about how she wanted her children and grandchildren to have that knowledge as well. And so a big part of my journey since reading those stories is just how um, I can be mindful and respectful of the ways that I interact with the land and all the beings that we share the land with. And so I believe, I, I feel that her teachings are a big part of what led me to the RELA project. Um, and the thing that really gets my attention when I read the stories in the book is, and other Indigenous stories, is just how they're so tied to the geographic landscape. So Rana touched on that a bit, but they, they really do remind you that humans and other beings on the earth are inseparable from the ecology. And so just as an example, in one of the stories in her book, she talks about a place called Hoodoo Rocks. And the story is that a woman, um, two women are cooking food and in doing so they were ignoring a warning from Coyote. And so as a result of that, he turned them to stone. And so people can actually go to those rocks and they're reminded um, of that story and of the natural laws of that place. So it's just really interesting how you can actually visit a place and feel the story. Um, and I'll just take a minute as well here to just differentiate between the different types of stories just to offer a bit of clarity there. So in the Okanagan language, we have what are called our Chaptik stories. And so those are a collection of silk laws, customs and values and other principles um, that define our rights and our responsibilities. Um, and those are kind of like our creation stories or what my grandma used to call legends. Um, but there are also stories in the book and other Indigenous stories that we read about how those teachings and laws are applied today. And so those could be kind of more like recent stories and how we live our lives and apply our understandings. 
Um, and so like our world and the laws that we live are always changing. And so as we know, even today with the current pandemic situation, um, we're able to adapt there. And so I think that's a big part of what Relaw tries to do is we'll find ways to apply the laws and those stories in a more modern way. Um, so yeah. Just, I'll just provide an example of an application story um, that my grandma shares. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so this story in the book is called Chaperon Lake. And so that's a lake in Douglas Lake, which is just up the road from where I grew up. Um, and they talk in the book about um, the bony fish in the lake. And so during the month of April, it was always referred to as the starving month because that was when they were kind of running out of food. And so there's a big rock at Chaperon Lake where people would pass by before they went hunting or fishing or berry picking and they would pray to the rock. And so she, would, she said that the rock would help them before they went on a journey. Um, and then in, in, um, in giving thanks for that, that people would leave a gift or some sort of offering as well. And so I ju I'll just quote out of her book. She says, um, they came and they were sick. And when they got there, they became alive. Chaperon Lake is a life-giving lake. The lake will keep you alive. And so I, I just think a big part of the lesson in that is the idea of reciprocity. And so before we take from the land, we should always ask and we should always give something back. And so even if that giving back is just an expression of gratitude, that's still important. Um, and to me, that's the law of our people. And so that's how we were able to survive. And um, that's something that I can take and apply in my daily life now and how I govern myself. So for example, if I go out onto the land to pick medicine, something that I would do would be to offer tobacco and just say thanks for the medicine that is being provided to me from that plant. And so I'll just go to the next slide. Oh, I see a question. Um, yeah, you can, you can get the book on Amazon actually. Um, so this is a picture of two Okanagan children's books that belong to my daughter, Sophia. Um, so How Coyote Broke the Salmon Dam is an adaptation of one of our Chaptique stories. And so in my experience, these are so beautifully unique um, when you read them. And the reason I say that is because when you read a when you read these stories, they're not what you would typically expect. And so you, you normally would read a children's book and you have the intro, you have kind of a series of climactic events and then a conclusion with a clear kind of moral to the story. And that's really not what you get here. So in this book, for example, the coyote one, it starts with his journey to free the, the salmon that are stuck in the dam. And so the people can eat. And so when you kind of make your initial predictions, when you start the story, you think okay he's going to face some challenges and then he'll ultimately free the salmon and save the people and then so the actual story is that he goes he frees the salmon and then it tells about his different um, journeys to individual communities and his decision making on whether or not he's going to give them salmon and so as we know from the previous story I told not everyone got salmon some of them got turned to stone so <laughs> it's just funny and then my favorite part is the last line in the book which which is um, kind of where you'd see the ending in most typical books and it's soon coyote forgot about the salmon he left them and went on his way in search of more adventures so it's kind of like a cliffhanger there <laughs> expecting like an ending um, but we had a teacher an indigenous teacher her name's Jennifer Narcisse and she came to speak to our Rila team in our cohort and she discussed how um, the way that the stories are written can be a really good learning experience for us and so when we try to find the lessons and the laws that are embedded in the stories that may be in the first sentence it might be in every sentence in the story it could like it, it could be anywhere in there so you have to really pay attention when you're reading them and I think the format too speaks to the interconnectedness of our stories. So what that means is that one story is quite possibly a part of a bigger collection of stories with not just a single lesson, but, but themes throughout. And so that's, yeah, that's just something to be aware of. And then another important aspect of the story that I just want to touch on is the idea of language within them. So both of these books have the Okanagan language as well as the um, English language translation. So I don't speak Okanagan. Um, and I like my dad and my aunts and uncles, they can't speak it. They were able to understand it. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of our nations struggle with, um, but that, that's a whole other topic. But just as an example, one of the words in our language is Siokwa. 
And so the meaning of that word comes from two different words. So the first part of that is siu, which is to drink in the human sense. And I'm not saying that very well, but I'm trying. <laughs> and that's so to lap as how, is an, how an animal would do. And so together they represent the law that the right to water is equal for humans and animals. And so I think it's just interesting because a lot of indigenous languages um, don't refer to things like nature, trees, um, plants, animals, water as it, like we do in the English language. And they actually refer to them how you would refer to a family member, like a brother or sister and things like that. So um, I think it, it just, again, speaks to the importance of seeing ourselves as being in relationship with the other beings and not above them. And so when we, we, we meet with the elders and community members like Rihanna and um, Max spoke about, um, it's really important part of the work we do because we're able to be given guidance because sometimes when you read the translation, you're not getting all the aspects of the law because they're also embedded in the language. So it's just an important piece as well. Um, and so for the next slide, Another thing that I just wanted to touch on was about how um, we view stories. So um, like often we view them as entertainment and that that's a good thing. Like it brings, it can bring a lot of good joy and happiness to have them as the entertainment, but also it's important to remember that the stories are an important source of law, learning, understanding and pride for our people. And so they, and they really can inform our perspective today. Um, and so I'll just share a personal story about that. Um, so as you all know, we're now in wood tick season. I don't know if there's lots of wood ticks around this year for everyone, but in my community, we're seeing a lot of them. I've already found two. So one on my dog and one on my daughter. <laughs> one of them was embedded in my dog and not my daughter. So that was, that was good. Um, but I was walking with a family member a couple of weeks ago and she said, she, like we were talking about the wood tick season and she said, what is the purpose of wood ticks? Like, why are they even like around like they're useless? And at that time I was kind of like, yeah, totally like they're gross. And anyway, the same day, the same day on my band has a Facebook page and they posted a Chaptique story about kill, kick, chill Ken, which is wood tick. And so um, when Coyote was starving, it talked about how wood tick brought him meat. And the story just talks about the wood tick and how she's the ruler of the deer. And that's why there's wood ticks on the back of deer. And so I think that was just a good reminder for me that all beings on this earth have their place and their purpose. And we might not always like them, but we should still be respectful. And that's, yeah, that's just something that I feel like I can, things like that happen where I'll relate it back to the stories in my day-to-day -day life. And just for the final slide for me, um, the RELA approach to understanding the stories, I'll just kind of, this is just an example of a case brief. Um, so what we do, we'll, re we'll read a story, like kind of like one of the ones I just told, and then we'll perform a case brief. And so that consists of asking these questions here. So what's the main human problem that the story focuses on? What are the facts that matter? What's decided or how it's how is it resolved? And what is the reason behind the decision? Is there an explanation? And then like a lot of different stories have different moving parts. So we kind of, the bracket is kind of just what other things have we noticed. Um, and after we do that, we can begin to build a framework of the legal principles in the story that can be applied. And so it's similar to how we would apply like a precedent when we think about Canadian law. So you have a case, you pull out the legal principles from whatever the judge has written in the case, and then you apply it to the new case. And so that's, it's, it's a good way because we can provide a bridge between indigenous and Canadian law. Um, if that's how the nation wants to approach it. And uh, Rihanna spoke a bit about the first year of learning that we do. So she um, touched on that, but some of the, so when we do, do read the stories that can be anywhere from 100 to 200 stories, like there are quite a few of them. And from that we'll have our case briefs and then we can start to um, build a framework of the different themes that come up. And so, yeah, that's kind of just how we approach it. Okay, and now the, the good part story time. <laughs> so for the next part of the webinar, we're going to tell a story. Um, and so I'm, ju I'm just going to invite you to get comfortable, do a quick stretch if you need to grab a glass of water. Um, and so this story is about 10 minutes long. So if you want to get on your floor or anything, just close your eyes and yeah, we'll, uh, we will offer some reflections about the story at the end. But here we go. So this book, um, this story is from this book called Ojibwe Heritage, and it's told by Basil Johnston. So yeah, there's a lot of Anishinaabe um, teachings in this webinar today. We did come together as a group, and we just kind of 
put forward different stories and we ultimately decided as a collective this story. So just to give some background of the process that we used. Um, so yeah, get comfortable. And just to elaborate too, there's a bit, there's a story before and there's a story after this story. So it's not just um, a start and an end, but it's like in the middle somewhere. Um, that's usually, yeah, like Shelby said, how Indigenous stories are. So. This story is called Father, Son, and Mother Earth by Basil Johnston in the book called Ojibwe Heritage. After Nanabush and his father, a Pingishmuk, had fought, they smoked the pipe of peace as a symbol of reconciliation, goodwill, and harmony between them. A Pingishmuk explained the ritual that he performed. The Anishinaabeg are to remember as they smoke their special relationship to and dependence upon the sun, earth, moon, and stars. Like the animal beings, they depend ultimately upon the earth and the sun. There are four orders in creation. First is the physical world. Second, the plant world. Third, the animal. Last, the human world. All four parts are so intertwined that they make up life in one whole existence. With less than the four orders, life and being are incomplete and unintelligible. No one portion is self-sufficient or complete. Rather, each derives its meaning from and fulfills its function and purpose within the context of the whole creation. From last to first, each order must abide by the laws that govern the universe and the world. Man is constrained by this law to live by and learn from the animals and the plants as the animals are dependent upon plants which draw their sustenance and existence from the earth and the sun. All of them depend ultimately on the physical world. The place, sphere, and existence of each order is predetermined by great physical laws for harmony. It is only by the relationships of the four orders that the world has sense and meaning. Without animals and plants, man would have no meaning, nor would he have much more meaning if he were not governed by some immutable law. For the well-being of all, there must be harmony in the world to be obtained by the observance of this law. While there is a natural predilection and instinct for conformity to the great law of balance in the world of plants and animals, mankind is not so endowed by nature. But man possesses understanding by which he can know and abide by the law and so establish his place in the world order. Man must seek guidance outside himself. Before he can abide by the law, mankind must understand the framework of the ordinances. In this way, man will honor the order as was intended by Chimanatu. The sun has his own path, gives and withdraws his light. The earth responds abundantly. Father, Son. From the earliest times, the Anishinaabeg honored the physical world of the sun, moon, earth, and stars, of thunders, lightnings, rain, winds, mountains, and fires. Superseding all was the sun. Even the position of the lodges reflected reverence for the sun. The entrance to the lodge faced the east, or as it was known, the dawn. By custom, the first person rising from sleep, half death, went out, faced the east, thought, and uttered uttered a prayer. By you, Father, through the sun, you work your powers to dispel the night, bring day anew, a new life, a new time. To you, Father, through the sun, we give thanks for your light, for your warmth that gives light to all. A further connection between the sun and man was dis deduced from the daily experience of dawn and dusk, the annual regeneration and dissolution of life. Each morning as the sun rises, the flowers open, the birds begin to warble, the animals begin to stir, and the shadows fade away. The sun infuses life into all things, and each evening with the set of the sun, the roses unfold themselves, the robins become silent, the animals go to sleep. When the sun withdraws light, he also reduces life. In the spring, when the sun grows warm, the whole world regenerates. In autumn, when the sun is less warm, life departs, leaving only shadows of what was and shades of what will be. In life-giving, giving, the sun is the father of all. 
Just as the Anishinaabeg rendered prayers of thanks in the morning, so did they give thanks in the evening for the gifts received during the day. But the analogy of son and man father goes beyond the obvious and the physical to symbolize the relationship of the begotten to God, or Gichimanitu. The son served only to symbolize this relationship and this theological understanding. Prayers of thanksgiving were part of daily life and living, not separate from man's labor or recreation, nor cribbed in ritual. As the giver gave freely and generously, so the receiver must acknowledge this grat his gratitude in the same spirit. To the Anishinaab beg, there is no gift or giving without a recipient. At the same time, the recipient must know how and, and in what terms to acknowledge benefits. The gift is, of life is given once, but it is renewed daily in each dawning. There is yet another aspect of the gifts bestowed by Gichim Manitou. Everyone shares in the gifts of light, life, and warmth. Thus, no one person may presume that the gift is intended for him alone or deny the enjoyment of such gifts to another. All have received. All must acknowledge the great bounty. Mother Earth The Anishinaabeg predic predicated fatherhood of the sun. In the same way they proclaimed motherhood in the earth, both sun and earth were mutually necessary and interdependent in the generation generation of life but of the two pristine elements mother earth was the most immediate and cherished and honored in function both father son and mother earth were different just as man and woman are dissimilar the sun illuminates the earth sustains with beauty and nourishment one cannot give or uphold life without the other perhaps motherhood of earth emanated from its elemental substance rock as such, it seemed to remain unchanged, enduring winds, winter, and summer. It appeared immune to change that man could see immediately, unmoving as it were, so as to live on in order to give life. The same kind of character and quality was expected of motherhood whose foundation was love. If children were to grow into manhood and womanhood, they had to have confidence in the abiding nature of the love of motherhood, otherwise they would be wanting in trust in themselves and in others. But the constancy of the earth in life giving and in the bounty of her giving was more assumed than that of human motherhood. The father son was given reverence. To the earth of the Anishinaabe gave love and honor. They prayed, Woman, mother, from your best breast you fed me, with your arms you held me, to you, my love. Earth, mother, from your bosom I draw nourishment, in your mantle I seek shelter, to you reverence. Just as the Anishinaabeg saw the sun as a symbol of the fatherhood of man, so they saw in the earth motherhood. A woman, by a singular act with a man, conceives and gives birth to new life. Thereafter, she must sustain the new life. In a similar way, the earth responds. With the coming of spring and the warmth of the sun, the earth conceives and gives birth to flowers, grasses, trees, and food-bearing plants. She then nourishes them. As a woman deserves honor and love for her gift of life, so does the earth deserve veneration. In honoring the earth through prayer, chant, dance, and ceremony, the Anishinaabeg were honoring all motherhood in a special way. The love and respect that the Anishinaabeg felt for the earth was perpetuated in the pipe of peace smoking ceremony. The first whiff of smoke was offered to Kitchen Manitou, the second to Mother Earth. It was an integral part of the ceremony without which the ceremony would have been incomplete and therefore void. Such was the way in which the Anishinaabeg publicly demonstrated their dependence on the earth and the veneration for the primacy of womanhood. Nor did the veneration for the earth end with the breath of smoke. There was yet another tangible way in which the motherhood of earth was venerated. In the pipe of peace smoking ceremony, the four orders of life and being were represented. Earth, plant, animal, and man. The earth, whose elemental substance was rock, made up the pipe. The plant to tobacco was the sacrificial victim. The animal symbolized by feathers and fur, was appended to the sacred pipe of rock. Man was the celebrant. 
The rock was strong and enduring. Plant beings, animal beings, and man come at to no end, but the earth lives on. Mother Earth continues to be bountiful, sustaining all beings. All else changes. Earth remains unchanging and continues to give life. It is a promise to the future, to those yet to be born. There is an addition to constancy in Mother Earth, generosity. This attribute is acknowledged in prayer and ceremony. A mother begets a child. She nourishes him, holds him in her arms. She gives him a place upon her blanket near her bosom. A woman may give birth to many children. To all she gives food, care, and a place near her. To each she gives a portion of herself. To each she assigns a place in the household. No child by virtue of priority of birth or other attributes may demand for himself more than his brothers or sisters. A mother gives equally to all of her children from first to last, from strong to weak. All are entitled to place near her bosom in her lodge. Her gift does not diminish but increases and renews itself. Similarly is the earth bounteous. Her mantle is wide, her bowl ever full and constantly replenished. On the blanket of Mother Earth there is a place for hunting, fishing, sleeping, and living. From the bowl comes food and drink for every person. All young and old, strong and weak, well and ill, are intended to share in Mother Earth's bounty and magnanimity. The principle of equal entitlement precludes private ownership. No man can own his mother. This principle extends even into the future. The unborn are entitled to the legacy of the earth, no less than the living. During his life a man is but a trustee of his portion of the land and must pass on to his children what he inherited from his mother. At death, the dying leave behind the mantle that they occupied. Take nothing with them but a memory and a place for others still to come. Such is the legacy of man, to come, to live, and to go, to receive in order to pass on. No man can possess his mother. No man can own the earth. Men and ages linger and then pass on. Mother earth remains whole, indivisible, and enduring. With death ends ownership and possession. Men do not outlive the earth earth outlasts man. As beneficiaries of their mother's care and love, children are obliged to look after their mother in her illness and decrepitude. Men and women owe their lives and the quality of living and existence to Mother Earth. As dutiful and loving children, they are to honor Mother Earth. Okay, so um, we've listened to this story three times already together. Every discussion has been very different. Um, there's so much in that story. Um, and what I took away from it today was how Basil talked about, um, or I think it was a pinkish mook, Nana Bush's father who was speaking throughout this entire story. And um, he talked about the order orders in creation and kind of it almost had an ending at the end um, with smoking the pipe of peace and then um, representing those orders of creation and um, with the humans being the last in creation um, so the most dependent and I think to make it a distinguishment um, to between stories that we read this one there was a lot of um, analysis from the storyteller Basil. So he was integrating his own experiences into the story as well. So it was kind of a mixture of, um, you know, an ancient story and his, his own story. Uh, so, so it made it even more richer because um, he was providing more explanation of what that means. So sometimes when we're reading stories, it doesn't really explain. Sometimes we have to read multiple, multiple stories to kind of understand what that story was talking about and start connecting them because they're always also interconnected. And I just love the fact that, um, you know, the Anishinaabeg um, thank, give thanks every day in gratitude. So, um, and then even touched upon the exchange and gift giving. And I, I really I related that to what Shelby was talking about with you know, when you pick medicines, you kind of give a gift in exchange. And she explained that example of tobacco. So I was able to kind of see her in that story too. And 
um, just the interactions between the sun and the earth are so beautiful um, and they're kind of balanced, but then Mother Earth is kind of lifted up a bit more because of her life-giving force, even though the sun is able to do that as well. So, um, and I just love the fact that in the story, there's basically no distinction between motherhood of Mother Earth and of um, like women, um, like human women. So, you know, that connection with the earth is so, so strong, right? Um, and we do see that it's, it's a lot of Indigenous women who are really, you know, standing up for their laws and protecting their lands and especially their waters. So we see that being expressed today. Um, but yeah, I wanted to pass it on to one of my, one of my co-panelists to explain what they took away from the story today. Yeah, so I, I'm going to just reflect for a moment on what you said about um, the gift giving and the importance of that. I, I, I appreciate what, it, what, what he said about there, there, there's no giving without a recipient. Mm -hmm. And it really reminds me of something that my grandmother said. And that is that, um, you know, when I was raising my, my young son and he was like two years old and she reminded me that in our language, there's no way to say no thank you because um, we have to receive so that he can learn to give. And um, anyway, so yeah, we're just reflecting on that, the importance of the recipient to the gift. And this, the stuff around complementarity is really, is really interesting too, like that emphasis on um, plants and animals and humans learning together um because that's an important part of of the work that we do and john burroughs talks about that as well about how we can learn from from nature you know that's one of the sources of indigenous law yeah i really love how we didn't make a plan for this part of the presentation because each time i've now heard the story something completely different comes up for me so the first part of it the first time I read it, I really focused on the sun. And I think it was just because I hadn't had any recent kind of stories that I've read about the sun. So I was kind of focusing on father son and how I felt about the light and the warmth that he brings and things like that. But I didn't, I completely <laughs> took a different thing from it that time. And even just what you said there, Maxine, about the recipient, it reminded me of when we were at the last Rila retreat and how you spoke about food and how when your grandma said you should never say no to food even if you're not hungry because it's a gift i think that was you was oh. it yeah yeah and i just that really stuck with me and since then i've um yeah i've really made made use of that lesson because it's something that someone's providing to you so you make use of it um yeah the um, and another really important concept in that story, I thought, was the uh, around um, not the being a trustee for the land mm -hmm. and ensuring that um, we're leaving something for our children and and grandchildren. That's such an important concept when we're thinking about the environment. Yeah. One other thing too that I wanted to um, bring to light when we're talking about stories. So we're kind of seeing an organic conversation. This is very much our approach um, to talking about stories. Um, but really we, we kind of ask ourselves some questions too. So um, what would happen if we change the pronoun? So there is a lot of he and him. This um, Basil did write this in the 70s, so it was a different time. But, you know, just talking about those gender rules and just that aspect of motherhood. So um, there's a lot of discussion too today with motherhood that it's not just um, motherhood of life givers, right? Aunties and all those other mother roles that kind of support um, the, you know, the life giver and that child. Um, so yeah, we, we kind of, you know, think of it, think of these stories in uh, a critical light too and kind of, and have those discussions um, about gender roles and, and co including, you know, two-spirit peoples and things like that. Um, because just like, you know, our laws and our stories aren't static, right? They kind of, you know, evolve too, like everybody else. So um, yeah, that's one thing I wanted to bring to light. 
Yeah, that's such an important concept that our laws are, are not static. They're not frozen. Just like Canadian law evolves and, and changes and adapts to different social and political conditions, our laws as well. So we yeah, have, when you were reading the story this time around, I was noticing the verb tense. There's a lot of, there was a lot of it, it, speaking about things as though they were in the past. And um, so, yeah, we, we really um, want to acknowledge that Indigenous laws are not <clears throat> static or stuck in the past, that they are very relevant and can be adapted to these times that we're in. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I, in the first part of the um, story, it, it said, for the well-being of all, there must be harmony in the world to be obtained by the observance of this law. And just so when I think about harmony in the world and the times that we're in right now, I think we're, we are seeing like a big spirit of community. And that's a lesson that we can take out of our stories and maybe apply today. And I think we're all kind of in this state of what's going to happen next, and but we can approach that from the spirit of community and i think that yeah the story we, I, I get something about that from the story yeah i i wonder if this is a time when we should think about the questions that we want to pose to the people mm -hmm. um uh, watching so one of the things that we think about in our organization is we think or we often ask ourselves you know now that we know the laws of these particular people in this particular place how do we live our lives as though those laws really matter which also connects to you know that really important question about implementation and enforcement so how do we get governments and industry to take indigenous law seriously but it also requires that we we ourselves take the laws seriously yeah so maybe that's a question that we want to to leave with the folks watching is you know now that you're you're aware of Indigenous law, or maybe you were already were aware, but how, how do you live your life as though Indigenous law matters? Maybe. You have I just have a question. note that there's a question in the chat um, from for the panelists about where uh, sources of stories, uh, where people could look for stories, uh, like podcasts, websites, books. Um, I know that they differ from territory to territory, but um, if you guys have any examples to share. Yeah, well, we always start with published stories because, you know, there are, there are some uh, uh, ethics around working with other people's stories. So we often start with published stories, with most of which are available in any library or, or bookstore or sometimes in museums even. Um, but uh, maybe, Rihanna, would you like to offer some suggestions? Yeah, I, me and Shelby were actually just talking about this the other day, but it's mm -hmm. sometimes um, um, nations or bands will have stories on their websites, but sometimes not. So it seems like in our experience, the best way to kind of have access to stories is yeah, going to a library or to a bookstore and, um, you know, go to the indigenous section and just try and find some stories. Um, yeah, if anyone else has other suggestions for us too, that's really helpful. <laughs> Even yesterday I said to Rand, like you can't just Google it and find any story. <laughs> like, that's not a thing. You have to kind of dig a little bit deeper. So yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, we only have a minute or so left before we have to wrap up for today. Uh, but I just wanted to say thank you uh, to our presenters, to Rihanna, Max, and Shelby, and to everyone who joined us today. Um, we are recording this webinar, and we will be sharing a recording, um, a video with all the registrants and attendees after the fact. So uh, look out for that in a couple days. Um, and if you are interested in learning more about ReLaw and the work that we do with Indigenous law, I'd encourage you to check out our website at wcel.org slash ReLaw. And uh, we'll also post a couple other links in the chat uh, for different resources you might want to check out to dig a little deeper into Indigenous law. And also, if you have any questions for us that you want to follow up with, things that weren't quite answered today, um, you can email us. Uh, you can contact communications at wcel.org, and I'll pass this stuff along to the Relaw team. Um, my email address is also in the registration email that you would have uh, received when you signed up for the webinar. Uh, so yeah, I think that's pretty much it. <laughs> um, anyone I'll else? seeing all the comments. Thank you yeah, for coming. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Boom. <laughs>
<laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Take, uh, take care. Stay well. Bye, everyone.